All right, and it looks like we are live. Hello, everyone. This is My Two Cents, and thanks for checking out my channel this evening. Uh, doing something rather unique in that I am hosting a debate as opposed to participating. Uh, the topic of this debate is anarchism versus minarchism. Can, the sta can a state exist in a libertarian society? Uh, debating in the affirmative will be the dark conservatarian and rational outlaw. Debating in the negative will be esoteric the free and filthy heretic. Uh, before we get started, though, I'm going to give each of them an opportunity to introduce themselves. So starting on the affirmative side, DarkCon uh, and Rational Outlaw, go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hello, everybody. You know me already. Dark Conservatarian, often guests on My Two Senses channel, on live streams, and mostly on mirror videos and so on and so forth. And yes, I am going to be arguing in the positive and teaming up with Rational Outlaw in arguing the positive. And All for right, those right. who, oh, sorry. And for those who, most of you probably do not know me, or maybe some of you do, depending. Uh, my name is Rational Outlaw. I am also arguing in the affirmative of minarchism. And uh, while my beliefs are based on mostly, I like to base my views on rationality, the philosophy of being rational. Okay, uh, Filthy Nesso. Oh, hi, I'm the heretic. I'm going to be arguing in the negative that the state and the government has no basis in existing in a libertarian society, and the argument I'm going to be using is going to be based on natural law. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Esso. I'm going to be arguing in the negative. Uh, yeah, most of you probably know who I am, so I don't need to explain my beliefs necessarily. But... Um, Yes, I think there are various uh, philosophical con problems with the concept of political rule itself. And yes, I'm going to be attempting to explain why there is no continuity between minarchy and the philosophy of libertarianism. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. And Pumpkin Row, thank you for the super chat. Uh, please ask positions on the nuking of Japan in World War II. Uh, Nate, the volunteerist, who is the chat moderator, please make note of that, and we will. Uh, that'll be the first question when we get to the audience questions near the end. Uh, as everyone uh, who watches my channel knows, I am an anarchist, but again, I am not taking part in this debate. I am simply the moderator, so it's my job to make sure that both sides stay within the predetermined, uh, agreed format for this debate, which I'm going to go over briefly. Uh, so how this is going to go is each side will be given an opportunity for a 15 minute opening statement, affirmative going first, negative second. After that, each side will be given 10 minutes for cross examination. So in other words, one at a time, each side will be allowed to ask the other side questions about their opening statement. The purpose of the cross examination is not to rebut or it actually engage any of the points made, but merely ask questions to for p clarification. And for each of these, the time limits, the entirety does not all have to be used. You can forfeit the rest of your time if you wish, but when the time runs out, I will uh, move on. Following that, each side will be given a 10-minute uninterrupted rebuttal. And then after that, we are going to move into open dialogue between both sides. Uh, and then at the end, we will take questions in the chat. So uh, getting started, affirmative side, so dark conservatarian and rational outlaw will be allowed to get take make their 15-minute opening statement to defend why they think the existence of a state is consistent with a libertarian society. Give me a second to get my timer going here. All right, uh, dark con and rational outlaw, you have 15 minutes to make your opening statement beginning now. All right, we agreed that I would go first. So originally I was going to uh, make a video talking about, uh, so explaining as to why I am not an anarchist myself, but uh, here we are. So, uh, so anarchism or anarcho-capitalism, to be more specific, I believe is a moral ideal. As even though I don't fully embrace it, I sympathize, however, with the talking point of taxation is theft. And don't misconstrue with uh, what I'm trying to say when I say it's a moral ideal. I don't mean to imply that anyone thinks that once Encapistan becomes a thing, that it will be perfect utopia or anything like that, just to clear that up. But all this said, I don't find anarchism attainable, much less sustainable for the long run. If the U.S. government were to completely collapse within the next few years, let's say, there will be complete bloody chaos. Mobs or... or 
mobs of Antifa, excuse me, roaming around to attempt to secure their own communist version of paradise, riots of welfare whores, pillaging stores and wherever else they can get their life essentials instead of immediately becoming self-sustaining individuals, multiple other groups looking to run amok enforcing their own social order on the weak and unarmed just because reasons and even possibly neighboring countries that'll look to conquer pieces of unprotected land and citizenry who are not well prepared enough for the impending threat but of course there will be the pockets of and caps and other types of libertarians who will be self-sustaining self-defending peaceful people but outside of those types of groups there will still be massive death with the fall of the u.s because of that alone i myself am in no ways advocating much less giddy of the immediate destruction of the U.S. as it stands today at large. But say the time comes that we in the U.S. come to a complete collapse, uh, or excuse me, but say the time comes that we in the U.S. come to a post-collapse, post-revolution, relatively stable time in anarchy, or instead of the complete destructive violent collapse of the U.S., we peacefully fade away all government in the U.S. region of the world and peacefully transition to anarchy or in Kapistan. Say either one of those happen to get us to a more stable time in anarchy. I will still say that it'll just end up back in square one in some cases in the goal of trying to abolish all government in the U.S. Um, there will either be people who won't give two shits about the NAP and other people's rights and will end up having mob rule. Or uh, like all the Me Too feminists carrying out their own vigilante justice, quote unquote, on whomever gets flagrantly accused of rape, for example. Due process just goes out the window. Or the innocent can form their own private court or security, as some people will uh, try and theorize, or possibly both of uh, both private court and security uh, for the sake of the protection and due process of the innocent. But so can the Me Too feminists can do that as well for carrying out their own version of justice, justice, quote unquote, among other examples of other ideologies. You'll have this court fighting that court over what is to be done with their own clients. The Me Too court will be all like, hey, your client raped this lady so many years ago and we want to bring him to justice. MRA court will be all like, no, we have to give him his due process first. What's the evidence that he's really guilty other than a vague accusation? And so they'll splinter off into their own regions with their clients living the, by them, I mean the courts. So the courts will splinter off into their own regions with their clients living close to their vicinity or in their jurisdiction to make things easier to guarantee their due process or lack of and protection of their rights or rather what they view to be their rights. To be living in, to be living inside the land that these said private courts have jurisdiction over or in the land that they might just outright own. And if the court clients are paying an often fee or else get kicked off the land or even put in jail, seems like in that example that everyone living in said land is back at square one and essentially living in what can be called a proto state. And if anyone says that they don't really have to live within the land that the private court has jurisdiction over for the private court to give them their services and whatnot, well, I don't see how that's really possible with multiple courts and or mobs in conflict with one another on what is justice. For how though, for how though minarchism or minimalist government rather is consistent with libertarianism, I'd like to simply say that with all the definitions that I've ever found on libertarianism, none of them are absolutely government exclusive, but neither is libertarianism inclusive of government in its definition. It leaves that part of the definition open, I will say, and I yield to Rash. Okay. Like Darkon, I believe the uh, idea of anarcho-capitalism sounds like a moral idea. However, I don't think it is realistic to human nature. I believe there will always be a group of people who wish to gain power, whether it be through force or through tricking people, and that that group can be a government, or like another government, an organization or a corporation or even a religion. We already see this in many different examples with uh, certain corporations doing very illegal or immoral activity or certain religions doing very atrocious things like Islam. My other point is even if you were able to attain an ANCAP society, I don't think it would last very long. I believe uh, you can slow down or prevent those kinds of group groups uh, 
any authoritarian groups from gaining power. However, I don't think you can stop them. I think you only can slow them down or prevent them. And my point is no form of style of government, whether it be a lack of government or a minarchist government, no form of government is gonna last forever. It obviously is gonna eventually collapse. Nothing lasts forever. My main point is that all you can do is slow down or prevent. And that's why I believe a minarchist form of government, depending on which kind you have, can slow it down. That's my whole point is to keep as much liberty for as long as you can. Okay, uh, you still have eight minutes and 20 seconds left. Do you wish to cede the rest of that time? I am believe I'm done with my points, my main points. What about you, Dark Khan? Yeah, I don't have much more to add, although I do want to say if anyone goes wondering or anything like that, yes, I did uh, get myself a few bullet points and words written down to help keep my train of thought going. But, yeah. Okay, uh... Bye. With the consent of both Darkon and Rational Law, they will be ceding their remaining eight minutes. Uh, at this point, uh, we'll move to Esso and Filthy Heretic. You also have 15 minutes to make your opening statement. Uh, you can go ahead and unmute your mics. Darkon and Rational Law, please keep your mics muted uh, during this time. Uh, Filthy and Esso, your 15 minutes for opening statement begins now. Yeah, now likewise, uh, between me and Esso, I, we agree that I would go first. So anyways... In order to figure out what a libertarian society, whether or not it would have a state, we need to know what libertarianism is. Libertarianism, briefly, is opposition, of, is opposition to unjust authority, relying on the distinction between just and unjust. What is just being what actions one can take that does not violate natural law. Anything that violates natural law, or to put it more concretely, but by no means interchangeably, Anything that violates the self-ownership of the individual is an unjust action. This is how we know that, for example, theft is wrong, which is the taking of property without consent, or how rape is wrong, since it's the taking of sexuality without consent. Nothing of what I said should be controversial among libertarians, least of all among us. Theft is unjust, whether we call it burglary, whether we call it burglary by a thief or gun confiscation by a police officer. Murder is unjust, whether it's a stabbing or an abortion. The labels describe different circumstances, but the action remains the same. Individuals that do these things are acting unjustly, and anyone who engages in unjust action is a criminal. Any individual who claims they can act unjustly without being a criminal cannot do so without appealing to a logical fallacy. Any organization that claims that its members can commit criminal acts is a criminal organization and cannot justify their claim without appealing to logical fallacies. This is how we know government actions are unjust. They legislate, creating rules and restrictions that we must follow. Failure to do so means that they will escalate force against us until we either comply or die, and that's only when we're lucky enough for when compliance is enough. They send indoctrinated young people who can't think or act as otherwise their schoolmasters would have wished to be traumatized, maimed, or killed in foreign wars of aggression against peaceful nations. They take our property without our consent and call it taxation. When they cannot use that alone to fund our victimization, they inflate the currency, hurting our spending power. Otherwise, they use our property against our consent once again as collateral against which to borrow more money from foreign banks. Once the debt is called, they can just tax the money, taking our property they need to make those payments. If one dislikes the actions another is taking, well, they should be able to refuse to fund it. We cannot do this with the government. If occupational licenses, minimum wage, foreign wars of aggression, abortion, capital punishment, the drug war, the surveillance state, victimless, crimes, corporate welfare, bailouts, subsidized housing, government schooling, military conscription, and more are not meeting our marginal interests, we can't simply choose not to have our stolen taxpayer dollars go to fund it, or even any of it at all. We are forced to associate with this criminal organization, this coercive monopoly called the government, which engages in all 
of the acts libertarians should recognize as unjust. Theft, such as through taxation, kidnapping, such as through jailing, murder, such as through war, and now that the South Korean government has mandatory girlfriends, and no, I am not kidding, we can include rape as well. What is the government except a criminal organization? Were a U.S. citizen to act in the ways the U.S. government acts, they would be arrested and the government would be applauded for doing so. Now, one might avoid having the government engaging in criminal behavior by restricting the government to a clearly delineated set of responsibilities. This still does not quite get around the problem because the government, by its very nature, requires theft to fund itself. If it didn't, then government wouldn't be necessary to have those services, wouldn't it? Since people would fund them voluntarily. Now, some will try to have it both ways. A voluntarily funded government, for example, surely is compliant with natural law. But if people are free to or to not fund a government, then they must also be free to disassociate with the government, else it is still a criminal organization. Similarly, others must be free to compete against the government else it is still a criminal organization. Such a government, it is argued, will be just, since people can choose to or to not fund it, can become entrepreneurs to compete against it, and the government is thus incentivized to provide goods and services that people actually want for a reasonable price. Naturally, people will not pay for their own victimization as well. So if this is the case, that the minarchist argument in favor of the existence of a government that does not tax does not restrict competition against its own services within its borders, does not force people to associate, does not legislate, or restrict others in any way, well, why even call it a government? Being a libertarian means consistently applying natural law to recognize what is just and unjust, and opposing that which is unjust. Any libertarian society must oppose any unjust criminal or criminal organization and must therefore be incompatible with having an unjust criminal organization ruling over them. All libertarians who take the principles of libertarianism to their logical conclusion can only ever arrive at anarchism. To do so otherwise means to either be inconsistent in one's own principles or to place government above reason, logic, and natural law. The former is simply a lack of understanding, while for the latter, well, if one places the government above logic and reason, is one even a libertarian? So is it uh, my turn My turn to go now? Yes. Okay. Um, so I just want to say to start off with um, my introduction that I saw a lot of conversation going on before the stream, mostly in screenshots from my server and other servers about uh, playing with the definition of words and getting into semantic arguments in order to try and obfuscate and avoid having a meaningful exchange about the philosophical underpinnings which make up these sort of concepts we're going to be debating tonight. And in its relation to political rule and libertarianism and i i just want to say right right off the bat that if this is what we're going to be doing then i'm not really interested in that kind of argumentation even remotely so uh if we're, after we're done with the introductions if we'd like to start by maybe defining our terms and going from there if you guys object to how we approach certain ideals then that's more than okay with me in fact i think regardless of your intentions that's probably going to end up being a major point of contention which we're going to have to address anyway and i think it would be helpful to get that out of the way since most libertarian arguments don't even really address that to begin with anyway so filthy i think summed up pretty well I think the reason why political rule is illegitimate in general, but something which I don't think he expanded upon as well as he could, uh, could have is why libertarianism necessarily has to come to this conclusion of rejecting all political rule. Uh, and this is because as a philosophy, libertarianism's first principles are founded upon a simple observation. Moral agency exists and every individual person has moral agency. 
And these are relatively uncontroversial observations, even outside of libertarianism. I mean, the fact that you're sitting down here talking um, shows a, a, an extent of a, that you are a, an, an agent. But therefore, as a consequence of this simple observation, an unavoidable conclusion has been realized, which is that every single person has a right to expressions of their own agency, such as exclusive ownership of the resources that they create or harvest, freedom of speech, freedom of association, etc. Because the only alternative would require a basic violation of the axiom of consistency or the law of non-contradiction. This being the assertion that it's possible a moral agent could justify expressing dominion over another moral agent since there's no tangible characteristic one could ever point to which would justify such a position any premise asserting this at most can only ever rely on special pleading and this is necessarily a thing the thing which makes coercion in general unjustified so to an extent um every approach to philosophy um sort of concedes this point so it's not presuppositional or a no true Scotsman argument to say that libertarianism has to be a rejection of all political rule, because as a necessary characteristic of its own foundational premise as a philosophy, its own truth claim, it stands as a refutation in and of itself against the legitimacy of such a declaration of power. Now, that explains why there's no continuity between minarchism and libertarianism, sure. But I think as a concept in general, uh, minarchism is flawed. For one thing, it assumes that, um, as I've pointed out previously, but some people may not have seen my recent videos, but for one thing, in order for there to be a coherent uh, minarchist argument, um, you're making an individual assessment of a firm and its association with other actors. And the problem is that in order for character judgments or assessments of morality around the idea of how small a government is relative to other governments, you have to compare it to another government and there is no tangible reason we can point to which would explain how that's logically consistent. And also, that would mean that if there were no other governments, that it would be impossible for a government to be just a, be uh, evaluated on its ethical legitimacy. So that's one reason why I think minarchism is flawed. Another reason why, uh, another big part of the problem that I see with minarchism is that it kind of assumes that the decisions of states are based around ideology or that there are no sort of incentives or material factors motivating the actions of governments and how governments expand and contract themselves according to sort of the realities of the world around them. And I think that's seriously flawed and it's kind of just obviously wrong. I mean, major metropolitan centers, for example, uh, are going to have more expansive states regardless of the stated position of the politicians um, that are ruling over the local city governments there because there is simply more that the state has to actually use in order to uh, exert its influence over that city since there's more going on because there's more people and more trade there. Another problem that this makes is that it kind of ass it, it assumes that um, a small government domestically or a, a government retracting domestically 
is not expanding elsewhere. And historically, governments which don't exert a large degree of influence over the pop the domestic population of, of their sort of nation, which they claim to rule over, are actually expanding by engaging in military aggression elsewhere in the world. And the United States itself, for most of history, has been a, a good example of this. Um, the British Empire also, uh, to an extent, was a decent example of this. Historically, tax uh, rates were always really low in homeland Britain, but yeah, it was it. Uh, the British economy was obviously imperialistic. You have one minute remaining. Okay, and the last thing that I was going to say is that I don't think for this reason that there is necessarily such a thing as an authoritarian ideology, because authoritarian co uh, principles uh, aren't really coherent. They operate entirely around presuppositions, and therefore they're nothing more really than a statement of preference. And this being the case, I think that uh, even what is a political action or a political leaning itself is up for debate. But, uh, okay, I, I'm finished with what I had to say, my introduction. Okay, uh, you see your remaining 10 seconds. All right, at this point, we're going to move on to each side will be given a 10-minute cross-examination. So, SO, as to your point about clarifying definitions... Uh, if, for example, you want to ask the other side how they define a certain term, you may do that during this cross-examination. If you want to ask some, about something specifically that was said during the opening statement, you can do that. But again, cross-examination, the point is uh, the positive side, it will go positive, then negative as before. So uh, Dark Con and Rational Outlaw, you will have 10 minutes to ask Filthy and SO whatever questions you may have about their position. Again, this is not uh, to rebut any points that have been made, but simply for clarification. Uh, following that, Filthy and SO, you will have 10 minutes to ask Dark Con and Rational Outlaw. So everyone is uh, okay to go ahead and unmute their mics. Uh, Dark Con, Rational Outlaw, you have 10 minutes to cross-examine Filthy and SO. Your 10 minutes begin now. Did you want to start? Did, did you say... Uh, okay. Um... So uh, I do uh, want to say that I agree that I, I overall don't want to debate semantics, but still for the sake of argument, um, what would you guys exactly define as libertarianism and uh, and uh, what uh, by what dictionary would you be going off for that definition? I define libertarianism as opposition to unjust authority. And I already explained... Uh, what the sort of axiomatic underpinnings of that position are and why necessarily they have to be those specific underpinnings. But by uh, what source would that be? You're, you're asking for a citation to an axiomatic truth claim? Um, pr pretty much uh, for a, uh, a definition on libertarianism. I, I don't think you understand how that works. I, I, Citing I, a dictionary definition? You're not going to find axiomatic principles in a dictionary. I mean, I can cite to you uh, people early on explaining, like, sort of the underpinnings of how this came to be, such as William Belsham uh, in his essay on liberty uh, and necessity in 1789, explaining that libertarianism uh, is the position which asserts exactly what I claimed that it did, uh, did, but in the context of a discussion of free will versus determinism. But the fact, w whether or not... Um, someone was first to say it is kind of irrelevant or who said it first no. in what context is irrelevant because this idea that oh we have to look at a dictionary or an encyclopedia to explain what libertarianism if, is it, it's it's a tautological argument 
because if I may, uh, entire, because slow it down for a second there. Okay. I, I mean, I'm I'm not looking for like who cited or who created the definition of libertarianism first or whatever else have you. I mean, uh, words evolve obviously, but uh, uh, I guess essentially um, to kind of uh, narrow down your answer. Would it me? Would it be that you don't have a, a dictionary definition that you're just? Um, well, I just using... think I just cited one uh, from what William. Was that again? I just cited one from William Belsham, but what William I was trying, but what I was trying to uh, get to is po saying my dictionary in response to explaining why logically something has to be a certain way in order to justify the axioms that it's proclaiming. I, that's not really, that doesn't really work. That's an entirely presuppositional argument. You're not providing me or anyone else a reason for why your uh, negation of that is true you're just saying well this is what someone else says that it ought to be mm, seems to be uh roughly the way that you you're being it's as a well lot. with it's uh, a lot. Say, saying that it that this, this is, is how like we ought to judge uh, libertarianism and its definition I, I guess i'll give you something I mean, to compare it to um you're familiar with when Marxists tend to reply to criticisms of their idea for how to achieve communism with, oh, the dictionary says that communism is a stateless, classless society, therefore all of these sort of problems uh, that are innate to it don't exist. That's presuppositional argumentation, and that's exactly what you're doing right now. Well, social, the definition of socialism, Marxism, has kind of evolved slightly over the years since Marx has died. It kind of doesn't matter. And it also, the well, thing, I mean, if we, if we really get back to it, um, socialism I mean, if, meant something entirely different before Marx came along, but that's not really related to the discussion. My point is, is that citing the dictionary is not an argument. I say it. It would be relevant to you're the not discussion, a, but if um, you're not addressing the sort of problems that we've brought up, such as how okay, do, I'm, gonna, how, I'm how pausing do the clock evaluate? for a minute. I'm pausing the clock for a minute. Uh, you you can continue this discussion if you wish, but Dark Khan, I would remind and Rational Outlaw, I would remind you, this is your time to cross-examine Filthy and Esso. So if at any point you don't like where the conversation is going, you can choose to cut it off and move on to another question. Uh, or, or you, if, if you want to use that time to let this discussion play out as it as it is, you may. I would just again point out that the rebuttals will come later. Uh, this was the primary purpose of cross examination is for you and Rational Outlaw to get answers to the questions you have. So I think uh, I'm going to just yield the rest of my time to Rational Outlaw then. Okay, uh, the clock is running again. You have five minutes left. Okay, how would you define? Minarchism to believe. How do you view it as? Which one of us are you asking? Uh, let's go with filthy. Minarchism is the philosophy of attempting to have a government with as few responsibilities and as few powers as possible. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. I just, yeah. And um, what does having uh, government schools and drug wars and bailouts have to do with minarchism? Doesn't that have to do with more of like other forms of governments where they're more republics or uh, a, a more uh, controlling governments? Well, that's the actual problem, isn't it? you're going to have individual minarchists who are going to argue that certain powers and responsibilities are the perfectly legitimate functions of a government. You have, for example, a whole lot of conservatives nowadays, mainstream conservatives, who claim themselves to be small government, limited government, will use this exact same rhetoric, and yet they'll say that it's the government's responsibility to ban porn. So ultimately, like the, the definition I gave is fairly abstract and oblique, but that's kind of the reason that I use it, that it can be used, that any 
political position that is argued to be the responsibility of a government is ultimately going to fit into the minarchist definition. And this is exactly sort of what I was driving at earlier when I was pointing out the fact that minarchism is dependent on another government to exist. If you have, it's it's an entirely arbitrary measurement um, for ethics because if you had two governments, one with a ninety percent tax rate and a ninety-one percent income tax rate, we'll say they're both income taxes, then the small government's the one with the 90% income tax, and that that would be more ethical according to minarchism. And I think that's rather disassociated from reality. Well, uh... <laughs> Did you have something, Darkon? Yeah, I guess to, uh, you had no more questions, Rash? Um, I think that's all my questions I have for now. Well, I guess just to clarify with uh, Esso, would you say that uh, the real definition, or would you say that the original definition of libertarianism was essentially a synonymous definition with anarchism? Yes, that's exactly what I would say. In fact, it wasn't until about 1950 that this idea that minarchy could be uh, about shrinking government or could be small government came into the picture. Do you think then that the definitions of marriage, gay, and queer should go back to their original definitions? That's not really comparable. What do you mean it's not really uh, comparable? Well, I just explained earlier that libertarianism my reason for saying libertarianism right. has to necessarily be a rejection of political rule is based upon how libertarians come to that conclusion and I mean, I don't the see philosophical has... underpinnings of libertarianism. And I don't see how it has nothing, to be that way if there's by nothing definition it's not necessarily that. There's nothing necessarily about marriage uh, people getting together and forming a relationship with one another that necessitates it being a man and a woman or the uh, the other nowadays anyways mentioned if well, I could... no there never has been but if I could... as, I, as i point uh, as i've pointed out with libertarianism uh, in order to come. Okay, to... I'm pausing the clock. Quick, you guys have 30 seconds left. So, do you want to let this continue, or did you? Yeah, have last last I, have one last I guess I'll let Rational Outlaw respond. My last question is for Filthy: Is how would you be able to maintain an anarcho-capitalist society or a right-wing anarchist society? Why would I want to maintain a right-wing society, a right-wing anarchist society? I'm talking about your anarchist society and Capistan, whatever you want to call it. How would you it's... maintain it? Instead of it being uh, some ANCOM type thing. Well, why would it? Why would I need to maintain it? Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to cut it off there. The, the time is up, and that last question wasn't really a clarif wasn't really a point of clarification. It was more of a challenge to the position. So, sorry about that. All right, something that I was planning on um, going over in our rebuttal anyway. But filthy, do you want to start? All right, hang on. Give me a chance to reset the clock. All right, uh, S.O. and Filthy, you have 10 minutes for cross-examination. Again, like everyone remember, this is not about debating at this point, but merely clarifying what position, uh, the position of your opposition. So your 10 minutes for cross-examination begin now. Uh, S.O., you want to start? Well, I assumed that you might want to, but I mean, I guess that I could start. So this sort of problem uh, being proposed of, how do you maintain an anarchy or an anarchist social order, I think is not very well conceived of foundationally. And that's because it assumes that natural law or the, ethic the ethical observations which would maintain a stateless order are normative or prescriptive. That being uh, the assumption that everybody sort of would have these moral conceptions, um, th the same moral conception as one another, or that uh, just for some reason, 
every court would be exactly the same. And that is not the truth claim being proposed by natural law proponents. Uh, the natural law in how natural law proponents uh, dis describe it is descriptive. Sorry, but the was there a question here? Well, I'm responding to what Rational Outlaw mentioned in the introduction and also in his re rebuttal, which didn't really get addressed quite clearly. Okay, I, I'm pausing. I'm, I'm pausing. Clock. So you can do that, and uh, I think the point Darkon's trying to make is that that uh, th that you can do. We're as soon as the cross examination is over, we're going to go on to rebuttals. So you can oh, start. Okay. So th th at this point, it's do you have any questions for Darkon or Rational Outlaw regarding clarifying what their position is? Something that sure. was made in their open Expose. statement. That sure. Make sense. How exactly do you maintain a consistent, cohesive legal order in a society where legal order is determined by force? I would say that it was set up about uh, uh, almost about 250 years ago in the United States, but of course it was uh, it had deteriorated. And I will say that it governments will always deteriorate even if they are set up with so many mechanisms to prevent itself from um getting bigger be a constitution or multiple um branches of governments that are that are able to keep each other in check uh either one or or an electoral college even for example um e even if you have so many uh so many checks and balances like that it will always deteriorate in eventually in all eventuality. But I would kind of say that uh, anarchism would fall under the same thing. I have to uh, agree with Dark Conde if I could also further clarify. Uh, I also believe that it would further, uh, that anarchism itself would also deteriorate over time. Perhaps I believe even quicker than that of uh, many other forms of governments. I believe it would uh, fall under more a tyrannical form of government or group uh, far more rapidly than a more minarchist form of government, depending on though specifically what kind of minarchist government, because there are certain kinds that would fall into tyranny uh, far faster than others. Well, you just negated your entire premise uh, if governments are bound to expand and deteriorate, then how can you argue um, for the state on the pragmatic grounds you proposed against anarchy? The whole point is to maximize liberty as much as possible and for as long as possible. That's our but whole argument. You're not. That, that's not a free society, though, because you have a monopoly on arbitration, which is imposing its will on the people, socially engineering is that behavior a question? and force. Is well, that a yeah, that, I, I guess that is a question. Uh, how can you say that you're maintaining liberty when your society that you're attempting to defend uh, is authoritarian and coercive by its nature? Would you like to take this, Darkon, or should I? Authoritarian and coercive by its nature. I mean, if you're going to say like the smallest, even the smallest thing, like a flat 10 or even 5% uh, tax rate, and uh, they're using all those funds to fund courts and, um, oh, and uh, to keep people's due process going, and a uh, police force that, does, by the way, does not uh, confiscate people's anything, but is meant to like uh, help enforce to make sure that people actually arrive in court if they commit a crime. Like a, when I, and when by the way, when I say crime, I'm talking about murder, rape, and stuff that is objective like that. Um, uh, if you're gonna call even the smallest thing like that authoritarian and coercive as compared to something like North Korea, well then. I, I can't really help with that. I would just uh, disagree that it is not authoritarian in the grand scheme of things. But you just admitted that governments, by their nature, cannot maintain something like that. Yes, Meaning but can I even that? Ignore we we could maintain it for the at least the short term or even the long term of things. I just said that eventually you, it is going to deteriorate. Can't. 
our whole but point you can't is argue that argue for the state on those grounds, even under the standards you established. Actually, we can. We're establishing no. it under maximizing the amount of freedom for as long as possible. What we believe we're, is anarchism we're not, will more than likely deteriorate in a far <laughs> faster rate. But we're, not not. Saying, just, we're not saying that said. we're not uh, wait just, we're not okay. saying that uh we're not arguing for minarchism or small government because it'll never deteriorate or anything like that We've that's never said not that. that's not what i'm saying what i'm you're arguing for the state around that exact standard we're trying to maximize freedom for as long as possible but even as you established there's fundam you can make fundamentally the exact same argument about the state that you attempted to make about anarchy you just said our that whole point is anarchism would deteriorate far faster there's nothing stopping it from some well, even, building even up according power. to your own standard uh yeah, this I mean, gets in this gets into something okay uh, I'm, I'm gonna cut in here i think i think the point has been made uh so you you may respond to what you see as a flaw in their answer in your rebuttal but i think but the question's been asked and they've given their answer okay all right, so I got, I got a question. Go ahead. Yeah. So how do you know exactly, I remember in Dark Khan's initial introduction, he was giving yeah. some very specific examples of pragmatic reasons that these uh, systems would eventually, the systems that would develop in a voluntary society would eventually become corrupt and eventually uh, either devolve into a state or basically result in something that resembles a state. But with this in mind, uh, how do you know exactly what mechanisms the voluntary society will take to uh, will have? Because ultimately, like the number, the main premise of voluntarism is the basis of rational humility. That we don't know specifically how a voluntary society is going to solve the problems of how do we provide apples, how do we adjudicate disputes. And that ultimately, like this is just going to be a continuous competition of people experimenting with different mechanisms through the marketplace and figuring out what works best and paying for that as well as new experiments to eventually replace that. So how do you know specifically that the mechanism that you described is going to be what is going to be most prevalent in a voluntary society? Simply said... I don't. I'm mostly just theorizing, but I would also like to add that this whole debate of uh, minarchism versus anarchy is all is basically, for the most part, a debate of theories. I mean, for what the future may hold anyways. I mean, in the debate of anarchy, people will argue of what is currently happening with the U.S. government and whatnot. But when we're talking about uh, what could happen under anarchy, it's a debate of theories. And I'm just like, uh, I'm just like uh, offering a one plausible theory, just like in the same way that ANCAPs will theorize that the roads will be paid for privately in this way, the courts will be paid for in privately that way. We do not need public sector this, that, or the other, because here's how the private sector will handle those uh, aspects of government instead. Your theory is not plausible, though, because you just fucking explained how it will never happen. One minute warning. What are you, what are you meaning? You just said, okay, so, so you're claiming that y your, your argument for minarchism is based upon theories and that you think that it is a, a, Wait, a solid... Minarchism? Yeah, no, you're, you're, your I, I, no. arguments for the idea of minarchism are based Okay, upon, I'm going I'm to uh, cut it off there. You can get into that in your rebuttal. So, Filthy, do you have any further questions? You have half a minute. Yeah, I, I was know. trying to ask one. You're claiming that it is a well-formed theory, but yourself, you just negated it by mentioning earlier that essentially everything uh, by which you argue for minarchism is not true. Do you uh, have a question? N no, I was not arguing. Uh, that is a question. I, I was not, not a question. That's a statement. Well, I I, I yeah, want to is, say no, very, I want to say I want to okay, say that, how that ten works. minutes ten minutes are closed. Dark con rational outlaw. I'll give you twenty seconds if you want to try and respond. I just want to say very quickly that I'm not undering. I'm not theorizing about minarchism. I was theorizing about anarchism. You said what I was saying of earlier. Our points are theorizing though, are based on theories. I was right, talking we're gonna about move under anarchism. 
Okay, we're going to move into the rebuttal phase at this point. Uh, so, Dark Con, Rational Outlaw, you have 10 minutes to do your rebuttal to uh, SO and Filthy's opening statement. SO, Filthy, please mute your mics at this time. Uh, Dark Con, Rational Outlaw, uh, 10 minutes for your first uninterrupted rebuttal. Begin now. All right. Would you like to start? Uh, sure. I do want to say, first of all, taxation being theft. Um, like I said earlier, I sympathize with the talking point. I do not know uh, right now if I like fully agree with the talking point. But nonetheless, even if I was to grant that it is theft, I would like to see some experimentation regarding of how uh, taxation would be handled for funding courts or anything else like that. Um, but that said, though, I would say that... Um, that uh, the happenings of taxation happening or, or taxation happening to fund courts and uh, all that other stuff to protect uh, people from the or at least plausibly protect anyways, people from like an angry mob that looks to steal their private property or anything else like that or, or keep the mob from t taking over a certain region. I find that to be less immoral than um, than, say, Antifa, for example taken over a region if anarchism was to uh, happen. And that's just one example. We could like bring up many other examples, but I'll save that for later. And I also want to mention very quickly that uh, what filthy heretic um, and plausibly so, but definitely fifth filthy heretic mentioning about so many things that the government does, we are not necessarily agreeing with or proving that the government is doing those things. Uh, the, the fact that the government is so intrusive when it comes to drugs and sex and all the other stuff like that, uh, thousands of different bureaucracies to control the economy and so forth. Um, and I would like to address uh, very quickly that, um, I don't know, I think it was kind of implied in the conversation right here that what I said is just essentially assertive, but it was kind of said, if not at least implied anyways, in the live chat by some people, that it's just assertions that I was saying in my um, in my opening statement. I would like to add, and by the way, two cents. Uh, tell me of when that five minutes is uh, up. Um, but I want to say that it's a very fair assertion, is especially taking into consideration the fact that obviously there are so many different disagreeing ideologies here in the United States, and Tifa v being a very prevalent one that does not respect anybody's uh, private property rights, especially the ones that are more c uh, communist and rather mob rule with their communism. And um, uh, also, oh, I, f uh, I forgot what else I was going to say on that point. Um, And I just want to say very quickly about abortion and the nap that th there are like multiple people, I mean, in extension of talking about different ideologies in the country. Uh, there are m multiple different uh, opinions regards of abortion. Even with anarchists, there are like different uh, views when it comes to abortion. I mean, is it a violation of the national, uh, na excuse me, non-aggression principle to be taking the abortion, to be uh, getting the abortion, or is it a, a violation of the non-aggression principle for that abortion to be prevented entirely? Is it a non-aggression on the woman or whatever non-binary gender queer guy uh, that is bearing the child? Um, there's going to be disagreements on that. And uh, of course, when it comes to like violations of the NAP, there are ideas of what you, you do with in regards of that violation of the nap. Do you uh, respond with force yourself? Like somebody kills you, for example, or somebody like uh, commits pedophilia. I'm sure that there will be multiple people who will want to uh, form their own lynch mobs to kill those pedos and so forth. Uh, with by extension in regards of abortion, I'm not trying to make any equivoc any equivocations that abortion in either side is the equivalent of pedophilia when it comes to morality. But the stand still, the point still stands, anyways. That if somebody was to commit abortion, somebody will want to respond. I'm not saying that I would want to respond. Somebody will want to respond, possibly even rather violent, violently, if abortion was to be committed. And then somebody is going to respond to that violent action 
upon the pregnant uh, mother or formerly pregnant mother or whatever else have you in that case. So who is in the right in that case? And uh, uh, is it the pro-choice side or the pro-life side? Within anarchism, there is going to be massive disagreements on that and possibly even huge turf wars in regards to it. Okay, anyway, five I'll, minutes remaining. Yeah, I'll y yield the rest of my time to Rash, just in time. Okay, for continue on a little bit of what Darkon was saying, there are going to be multiple disagreements. Abortion is one of the biggest things in which nearly half the country is pro-abortion or pro-choice, whatever you want to call it. Or then the other about the other half is pro-life, where they're extremely against abortion. And there's even different kinds of pro-lifers. Some are only around the maybe they cut it off like around the second trimester and onward you can't have abortion, but they'll say, okay, the first abortion, the first trimester you can't. And then there's people on the pro-life side who are completely against abortion, whether from right from conception. And then there's some where in certain weeks in the first trimester. There's different forms on even even in those particular fields of uh, arguments, uh, different groups of people. So in my point is that there's going to be different disagreements on pretty much about pretty much everything. Even in, as Darkman was saying, anarchist societies, there's going to be disagreements on different things, how th certain things should be applied. How many times should someone be given the right to a trial, whether it be two times, one time, as many times as they want. There's going to be disagreements and you have to be able to settle those things uh, within your society to be able to get anywhere. Otherwise, you're not going to get really anywhere and you're just going to have groups fighting each other. And well, you're going to have literal anarchy and fight with everyone fighting each other over these different agreements, just in different ideas, different ideologies. My other thing is that uh, the whole point of minarchism is to, as I said before, maximize the amount of liberty for as long as possible. The whole reason for this is because we realize the human nature of people to disagree, to want to fight each other, and, or to gain power. All these different groups having different ideas, different values, and everything. It doesn't matter whether there's the non-aggression principle. It doesn't matter whether what is right or what is wrong. People don't care about that. They they really don't. They really don't care about that. What they care about is their feelings. They don't care about the facts. They don't care about any facts. They just care about what they believe to be right, not necessarily what is right. That is why a I believe a minarchist society would be perhaps the best system we could perhaps have is because we can maximize the amount of liberty as pos and as much as possible and maximize the amount of time we can have that liberty as much as possible. However, where I believe in anarchist society, where it starts from nothing, I believe a much greater force will try to take up either through force or through co or force or coercion or for tricking people into gaining power and will become far more tyrannical, far faster than a minarchist government would. My other thing I would like to say is Schools, wars, and drug wars, things like that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with minarchism. Those are more the conservatives, which I don't think most conservatives consider themselves minarchists. They usually just call themselves minimal government people or small government, which really isn't quite true, I would say, personally. And the other thing is minarchism does exist because although it's kind of somewhat subjective but it's also somewhat objective for example i think most of us here would say the the guy who taped a banana to the wall is not art most of us would say blatantly outright that's not art because one minute remaining okay that's not art that's the whole point is that's not art we would say that's not art that's that's just a banana taped to wall. If anyone could do it, then it's not art. The whole point is certain things are somewhat object, uh, somewhat subjective, but they're also somewhat objective. So I don't think you can say that minarchism uh, doesn't exist in some form. And I believe I've finished all my points. 
All right. Uh, you're seating your final 30 seconds then? Correct. All right. Dark Con, Rational Outlaw, please mute your mics. Filthy, uh, so you can go ahead and unmute yours. Uh, so Filthy, you now have 10 minutes to make your rebuttal. Uh, 10 minutes beginning now. You want to go first, Filthy? Yeah. So I kind of might be going a little bit ahead of myself here, but I think it's very interesting the extent to which I make all sorts of natural natural law arguments against the argument of against the states and the point that you use to try to rebuke that is to try to appeal to pragmatism as though you have already conceded the fact that the government itself is immoral and that there is no way to get around this ultimately the only arguments that i'm honestly hearing in favor of a government is that it's absolutely necessary for multiple reasons including the warlords argument and the roads argument which have been reputed not just by the both of us, but by other ph by other uh, anarchist philosophers numerous times. So I don't think it's really worth uh, getting into he getting into that here. With that being said, the point of a minarchist society that ultimately makes it unviable is that you have no way of knowing what a minarchist society looks like, and you have ultimately no control over what form that'll take. As stated earlier during the rebuttal stage. Was it the rebuttal stage? No, this is the rebuttal stage. The cross-examination stage. The government has, or what constitutes a minarchist government is going to vary from person to person. What statements or what justification you have to say that North Korea, for example, is not a minarchist government, you have really no consistent basis to make that argument. Because ultimately, they could just say, like, yeah, we're limited because we don't allow landowners to own property. We only allow the government to own property. So it's a limited government. Not to mention that the North Korean constitution is pretty similar to the U.S.'s. You've also conceded the fact that a minarchist government is ultimately not going to last. And your only reply to that point is that you think an anarchist society would not be able to last. However... So far, your only mechanism by which to make that point has been to claim features in a govern or features in an anarchist society, which you conceded you're not even sure would even be there. How can a private how can private courts, for example, become corrupted and achieve a monopoly on arbitration when we're not even sure that private courts would even exist at all? Ultimately, I don't think you really have a consistent basis by which you can make an argument against the voluntarism or any sort of uh, any sort of argument in favor of an anarchist society. The trouble, the real trouble, though, I'm kind of losing my train of thoughts. Freaking hell! Yeah, so you want to go? Um, sure. There was a point. There was a try that I was trying. Um to establish earlier, but some, something that I've noticed is that um, the minarchists in this debate haven't really proposed an argument in favor of minarchism. They've just made arguments against anarchy, which that's fine. I'll be going over that uh, here, but I mean, that uh, is pretty telling, and the few things that I have heard that somewhat resemble an argument for the positive are not only entirely presuppositional, but the minarchists here themselves have conceded uh, do not tangibly reflect lived reality in any f form whatsoever. Not only that, but they've also conceded that uh, they their arguments for an against anarchy are not really well founded they're just based on their own theories of how people organize or how human nature works which by the way those are flawed for several different reasons um the first being the existence of diseconomy of scale ensuring that there can't be a firm that just buys up all the resources and becomes a state the other problem um that i've noticed mainly with the argument against arbitration which has been pervasive through their responses is that um this is not really an argument against 
uh, anarchy because it's kind of a straw man of our of our position as i was trying to explain uh earlier um this assumes that natural law arguments are based on a normative description of morality or a prescriptive description of morality but they're actually based on a a descriptive explanation of an of something which can be tangibly observed um axioms and, and the like so it's not really we're, we're not saying oh everyone will be moral and no one will commit crimes what we're what we're actually arguing is that because ethical observations exist because we can observe them uh there is a basis for which a sort of legal or uh, legal order can exist, because one of the sort of foundations which motivates hu all human action is to achieve a sense of asset stability. So everyone not only would have an incentive to go to an arbitration service or to prioritize arbitration but the most objective form of arbitration which could possibly exist at any given time would be sort of the incentivized model of people coming along and entering the arbitration um market could propose and that's not and, and another thing is you're assuming that they're private courts well, or that they operate around one payment model, which is more just a general problem with uh, another general problem with your arguments. So you're kind of assuming uh, baselessly that in an anarchy, there's only one way people would seek to obtain resources, or there are only a fixed number of ways. And there's no real reason to believe that, especially with how much more accessible resources in a stateless society would be. It, the only reason that that even really is the case in the current political economy is because you have all these barriers of entry, all these finance restrictions, and all of these other uh, monopoly state privileges established by the state to... Um, establish business cartels and benefit uh big corpos so something that nothing that you've really proposed as a counter argument on a on pragmatic grounds even really conceptually works and this becomes even more problematic when you look when you take into consideration the fact that your argument against anarchy is that Okay, there there are all these different arbiters with you know they they could have different standards. Well, well the thing with a state society is that in state societies, um, you have all these irrational people. People are still irrational, and they don't apply ethics consistently to their own lives. But the difference is is that you have only one arbiter. Everyone is forced to associate and fund with it and fund it, and they are ultimately not not only. Um, they're sort of the pillar of society, so they're not only an arbiter that is not objective, is led by emotional, irrational people, that, but also because of the way that governments are organized and fund themselves, uh, there is actually a structural incentive to antagonize the interests of people who are not associated with the state. Uh, Filthy pointed out a couple examples of this in the introduction. Um, the state establishes cartels in the pharmaceutical industry in One order. Minute to warning. Uh, okay. So you mind if, you mind if I make a closing statement once you're finished? Yeah, sure. But I was just gonna say I'll list my final thing, which is just the example of pharmaceutical cartels being established by the state in order to expand revenue by manipulating geopolitical events. But yeah, all right. all right. The state, the closing statement I just want to make in regards to the rebuttal is well, since the definition of libertarianism is not really in dispute, the question as to whether or not it's compatible with the government really shouldn't be controversial at all. 
so clearly the government is not compatible with any libertarian society and any society with a government cannot be considered libertarian. The most telling, at least to me, is that the overall is that the overall minarchist argument against anarchism is that anarchism will eventually ev devolve into minarchy. If that's the case, then my only question is, what have you got to lose? All right, uh, time has expired. All right, uh, at this point, uh, we've been going streaming for an hour and ten minutes, uh, and we are about to move into the uh, open dialogue portion of the debate. Uh, this is the one that has the most potential to get out of hand. So I would, uh, everyone is free to unmute their mics. I would ask that everyone please try to be respectful to one another. Allow someone to finish what they're saying before you jump in. Uh, I will mute people's mics if I feel it's necessary, but I'm going to try to the best of my ability to allow you guys to talk back and forth and engage the points that you want to. Uh, this will go anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes, and then we will move into the questions. Okay. May I start? Go ahead. Um, as to your point about the uh, anarchy possibly turning into minar a minarchist society, no, that's not exactly the point I was trying to make. My point was that I believe it would go into a very tyrannical form of a government or some government system that would take over, not necessarily a minarchist form. I would think it would be far more likely a more tyrannical form of government would take over an yeah, anarchist society. It could go either way. But uh, on what Filthy, like, last said in his statement right there, that was kind of my point, is that uh, uh, trying to achieve anarchism, that seems to be kind of a moot point. And I guess um, um, in, in regards of my argument for m minarchism, that's part of it right there, is that I think that anarchy is a bit of a moot point because it'll, like, come back uh, full circle within uh, probably a short amount of time. Uh with uh, each region appropriate to their circumstances, uh, come back full circle to being under a government. And my argument for minarchism, minarchism, and I thought it was kind of implied, is that uh, preserving due process and rights and liberties. I thought that was kind of implied in why I believe in minarchism uh, in my opening statement right there, but I guess it wasn't clear enough. And uh, I also want to say that as so I did not say that nobody will commit crime. That's also what I said in my opening statement is that I fully realize that ANCAPs or anarchists in general realize that once we get anarchy, that it will not be completely perfect utopia and that there ultimately will still be people committing moral atrocities like murder, rape, and so forth. Of course. And I think we can all agree that uh, an anarchy is no guarantee that crime will never be committed, but statism in any form is a guarantee that some crime will. But that said, back to the original topic, is in a, is libertarianism compatible with uh, a state? Yeah, that's clearly not being disputed, so I have to assume that you are all mm. conceding that. No. I was trying to say that I don't think that government uh, or state, rather, as uh, the, is a term that you use, is inherently contradictory, is not exclusive nor inclusive of the definition of libertarianism. If I, may, you haven't. If I may pull up uh, Britannica, political philosophy, that being libertarianism, that takes individual liberty to be the primary political value. And they're explaining in some of this paragraph as well that it's somewhat synonymous with liberalism, the classical definition of liberalism anyways. And uh, the, pap the page that I have pulled up, it goes on some other subjects as well. I do not know if uh, the pre you guys want the me precursor, to link to The precursor to the, li to the libertarian philosophy were the levelers back in the 17th century. So, uh, I mean, the source that you just cited... Um, I mean, aside from the fact we've already gone over, the, the mud dictionary argument doesn't really address any of the points Filthy and I have raised. That's just, uh, like, that. that's just objectively wrong. <laughs> no, not objectively. Yeah, because... I mean, liberal, uh, I, 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 mean I thought I... Uh, like, yes, like you said a little bit earlier, like you said a, a little bit earlier about trying to address the earlier point... I thought that that was what I was uh, trying to well, get down to, or at least implying, is that 
I'm not going to like heed your complete and utter denial of the definition of words as described by uh, certain dictionaries. I'm not. I'm not Any denying dictionary. that you can use the definition of words in, in a certain context as a description of colloquially how certain phrases or terms are used in discussion. Uh, sure. I mean, they can be a benchmark, but what I'm point, but for philosophical discussions uh citing the dictionary as an explanation of what a word is it's an entirely presuppositional tautological argument so that's why i'm rejecting it i've provided an, a very cohesive uh consistent explanation of why libertarianism necessarily has to be a rejection of all political rule and your your rebuttal of that is that's not what the dictionary says so can we please from refrain from those kinds of making fun of people yeah if you want to get aggressive I then i guess we'll rumble but uh, aside I'm from that, I would being like uh, aggressive. To, uh, I'm just this is well, ridiculous. you're you're mocking me, so that kind of implies that. But I, I do kind of uh, sympathize with rational outlaw and want to try at least try to keep this civil. I mean, ultimately, I guess my point is just I just dis, uh, I disagree with uh, your point there. I mean, I I don't see of uh, what basis there is for me to. Uh, come to an objective agreement with you on objective between you and me at least anyways as so do you have any questions filthy i mean we i think I've, i think i've kind of made my point that the definition of libertarianism that is most consistent with with the what's put forward by philosophers as well as its historical i was mostly roots. talks if i may just interrupt really quickly i was mostly talking sure. about if you had any other forms of questions i i'm done with the whole dictionary definitions i really don't care about that part okay so yeah and i guess sorry for the snark because yeah apparently people aren't liking that but i just i i don't know how else to go forward here because i've pointed out a couple i've i've brought this forward a couple different times um you don't really have any sort of objective truth claims when operating within the assumption that political rule is legitimate. You just have preferences being put forward as if they're these sort of claims for how things should be. And you don't also have a rebuttal to something that I'm put that to what I put forward as an explanation of libertarianism because I'm putting forward axioms and you're trying to like use this utilitarian weird empiricist approach to that to my argument and i don't really know how to go forward from here because yeah you keep you're i mean on top of that the fact that you're not really giving me anything to work with um You've also kind of negated your own entire argument with some of the things that you've said earlier. I mean, I can point out the sort of problems with your claims about anarchy that, yes, we can point to things which exist, such as diseconomy of scale, which show that the sort of foundational premises uh, for your assumptions of how things would go in an anarchy just straight up could not happen. But and also that well i wouldn't say that it could not happen said, I, you've already said the that uh your case for minarchy against anarchy just doesn't really exist that it's not true and that it's not foundationally sound so never, i don't know what else to say my, really that my right. case doesn't exist i kind of thought i stated it earlier but okay well i'd also like to on. sorry continue what were you going to say, Filthy? I was just going to say, well, I mean, you've said the entire case for minarchy is you need a, you need a, a quote-unquote small government, which, by the way, I still haven't heard a response to my explanation of how that doesn't work on a, a conceptual basis to evaluate the, the ethics of a government based how? on the scale. But, okay, um, well... But what I was going, what I was going to say is that uh, god damn it i lost my train <laughs> so anyway anyways the point the point that honestly the kind of takeaway i'm getting from 
the case that you two are making is that libertarianism is consistent with a government because some governments are bigger or smaller than others. Mm, no, no, not really. I mean, if uh, a government uh, gets so intrusive that it starts violating people's religious rights or uh, or even start banning homosexual marriage or possession of any kinds of drugs, and that would or be... Or freedom of speech it's... or freedom to defend themselves. Yeah, it, it, individual liberties like that. So you would so you would agree that a government that takes away people's property is not libertarian? Yes, I don't believe in eminent domain. All right, so you would also agree that a government that uh, for, that prevents people from competing with it in terms of the services it provides is also going to be uh, not libertarian? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want the government to have complete monopoly on some certain uh, things. I mean, I don't see as to how... Uh, uh, some certain courts would be able to compete with other courts, but if that could theoretically be done, then whatever. But things like security, like uh, private police versus public police, not not against that, not against uh, there being pr private firehouses or private roads or anything else like that. And I'm certainly not for nationalizing all healthcare to get us like an NHS style of single payer healthcare system or anything else like that. Of course, of course. And you would also agree that it's that a government that is com compatible with libertarianism would not be engaging in creating rules that people are required to follow, even if they had no role in deciding on what those rules are. Could you specify what you mean by what rules? The legislation. Like a, what kind of legislation would you be specifically like, talking about? Like any legislation. Just a even, even, like a politician. Like a politician is just writing rules that others that had no consent or were never asked whether or not they want to follow this rules are still required to follow nonetheless. Are we talking about rules like uh, certain things in which are we talking about like what about laws time, regarding or we're talking about murder? laws in general? Uh, I'm not going to call legislation law because that's a bastardization of what law is. Uh, we're just we're not talking about definitions. We're just well, I know, but anyway, I'm just yeah, I'm just stating. Are we talking about just like crimes, or are we really? talking about crimes like murder and theft? Are we talking about all of them, or are we just talking about specifically victimless crimes? Yeah. Well, the problem though with calling it law is that it fundamentally it, it essentially makes a truth claim without actually making an argument. Well, that's not what we're trying to do. Okay. Yeah, that's not. That's all we were. We were yeah, not talking I mean, about that. That 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 aside. That aside is so. Fair enough. We were talking. We're just talking about like the concept of legislation, which encompasses things like vic victim crimes and victimless crimes. Well, that's exactly what I was about to go into, uh, because it's backed up through coercion. The co legislative fiat is arbitrary, so I'm it's just, not. It I'm doesn't. Trying to ask something. Call it law, okay? What yeah. So I'm just. I was just asking about like whether or not they would consider legislation, which encompasses things like victim and victimless crimes. If that is compatible with a libertarian government, victimless crimes, for the most part, I would say no, they are not compatible with a libertarian form of government. And by I'm extension, curious. I would say that I would differentiate victimed and victimless crimes. Victimed crimes, that being the term that was said earlier. Yes, of course. And I'm just curious, uh, rational outlaw, what you said for the most part, victimless crimes are not crimes. I'm curious as to an example of a victimless crime that is a crime. I will. Well, for one of the examples, although this is something I don't think any form of anyone should have, is nuclear power. Or not nuclear power, I mean nuclear weapons. For example, I don't believe the government nor any singular group or person should have a, a nuclear weapon because, one, I don't think it is necessary for anyone to have, and two, I think it can do damage potentially, uh, whether accidentally or on purpose, to the environment or to other people if it was accidentally released. I, I, I want to say that I kind of slightly disagree with Rash on this. I mean, I, I'm kind of apathetic regard, in regards of whether or not that nukes get uh, decriminalized for the um, for the private citizen to own. Um, I, I mean, if it, it was decriminalized, well, then very, very, very few people would be able to uh, attain one because it'd be so damned expensive. Yeah, I well, think so. But the point, anyways, uh, sorry, so the point that I'm uh, trying to get at is that given that we 
you at least you, Darkon, agree that a libertarian government is not going to take people's property. It, therefore, it's not going to tax. Or it it's shouldn't not going anyways. to correct. So it's not going to tax it. People can compete against it, and it doesn't legislate. Then that's not a government. That's a, that's anarchism. You're an anarchist. And mm, back to um, nah. well, back to the point is. I mean, this is doesn't really necessarily pertain to nukes themselves, but nukes would be a great example of exactly why, on uh, practical grounds, uh, there are arguments for. Uh, against the state, I mean, even within how the state is conceptualized by minarchists. Um, you yourself just said it. It's not desirable for the state or for anyone to have them for any for recreational use, at least in my opinion. I mean, there's nothing ethically inconsistent with it. But yeah, um, I don't think that it's desirable. But the thing is, is that they exist. So the best thing that we could do to counteract that would be to essentially have as many people working with them or that have access with them. One, for a form of sort of mutually assured destruction, but also so that the negative consequences of a nuke going off could be counteracted because there's there are more people approaching research with them and more methodology is going into this meanwhile if they're all national if all the nukes are owned by the state well not only is nobody really experimenting with them and there's no improvements to the sort of potentially devastating effects they would have on the environment if one went off but also, um, on the other problem that you have is you have nothing but a bunch of people who are complete psychopaths with something that could literally destroy the world. And I don't think that's desirable. I, I'd say at the very least, uh, anybody should be able to, in order to counteract the psychopaths, to, should be able to get their hands on something like that. So, did you have anything uh, to say in regards of uh, nukes? I I just did. Oh no, sorry. Did I say so? I meant to say rational outlaw. My bad. I just my opinion would be that uh, I don't think uh, mutual sort of destruction is a good enough reason. Personally, I think that's a pretty poor argument in my personal view because. If we destroy everyone, there will be nothing. I don't see the reason why we should have that. Now, as for your point that there would be some crazy person that could have it, yes, I admit that there is the potential possibility of that. However, I think it's unlikely that they would have enough to do uh, basically destroy the earth, like as we do right now. We have enough nukes to destroy the earth 11 times over. And I don't think we have any necessity for that many nukes at all. Can I make a point on the uh, nukes question? I know this is off topic, but I just wanted to uh, say something about it real quick. Sure. Yeah. So with nukes, it's not going to be different than any other form of property that others would consider dangerous. A lot of the points that you make about nukes, although are completely understandable, don't get me wrong, are the same thing that a lot of uh, Democrats, liberals, and socialists say about guns. Ultimately, I think Dark Khan is absolutely correct when he says that, yeah, nukes are going to be ridiculously expensive. They're also going to be ridiculously expensive to maintain, and the facilities required to be able to house a nuke without, you know, killing yourself with radiation poisoning are going to be ridiculously expensive. This creating enough of a barrier to deter the overwhelming majority of people who would otherwise want a nuke from getting one. I mean, speaking for myself, I don't want a nuke. I want a nuke silo. But that's a... <laughs> <laughs> I think we all want a nuke silo. Yes. Especially one with a hot tub and stuff. I would very much like that as well. <laughs> hey, see, so we can agree on something. Yay. But, yeah, my point is that uh, a nuclear weapon is no different than any other form of property. And, yes, there is danger. That's absolutely correct. But I think that, the, I think that there is enough of a 
cost in relation to the supply and demand that is going to prevent people who would otherwise be irresponsible with it. I mean, after all, if you're an idiot and irresponsible, there's a very high chance that you won't have the resources to be able to get one in the first place. And hopefully anyone who does sell them won't sell them to an idiot. Well, I mean, of course, especially since they won't sell them to an idiot who only has uh, $30 to his name. <laughs> Although we also have to admit there are some idiots who are very rich. There, That is true. I don't know why an idiot would... I don't know why a rich idiot would want to nuke, though. <laughs> um, who knows? Maybe, uh, maybe strong arming. I don't know. Uh, the only reason I can think of is that because they want to see a nuclear explosion for themselves. In which case, I'm pretty sure that there are ways to accomplish this, like blow up some uninhabited island and sell tickets. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and interject here. Uh, excellent job, guys. I'm not talking over one another, so thank you for keeping the discussion civil. At this point, I would put to any of the debaters, if you need to step away from the computer for a minute or two, uh, go ahead and do so. Uh, and as soon as everybody's back, we are going to move into uh, the questions from the viewers. Uh, Nate has been keeping track of questions. If you And if you still would like to ask questions, you can keep posting them in the chat uh, and see if, they, uh, if uh, Nate wants to put those out as to be asked. Just remember, please keep them on topic. Uh, are, are any of the debaters in need of a break or ready to go right yeah, into the play? I, I do, but I also want to add very quickly. Sorry. Uh, I, I will I will say that uh, after uh, bathroom breaks or whatever, that if we were going to have like another section of open dialogue, then I do have some other things to address at that point or if or whatever. We'll see if we have time. I, I'd like to keep this around two hours. We can go a little bit longer if we need to. But uh, all go. right, it I'm gonna end. just go ahead and get some coffee really quick. Okay. I'll still be here. I'm fine. I just how, right. how long were you expecting the stream to go on? Because I mean, uh, be right back. I think it's probably going to go close to two hours, if not two hours. That that sounds fine. I guess I just wasn't expecting it to be this long. Well, I've, been, I've enjoyed it so far. But okay. and I don't have any issue with the length. But yeah, I, I was thinking it's going to be more like an hour. But all right. So I guess just me and you, two cents. All right. For the time being, uh, I see that the Nate has posted the first question that he's uh, written down. I'll put it up on the screen here. Which state has last? Oh no, that's not the question. Uh, how do you limit a country through a long term? Is the U.S. a clear indication that it didn't work? I would say the U.S. did work for, in is still working for, for the most part. The majority of the growth seems to have happened around in the early 1900s uh, with the growth of the government. However, we still have predominantly most of the freedoms, although the government is a whole lot bigger. Yes, I agree but I would say it has relatively worked. I don't consider the U.S. right now a any clo or close to a minarchist government. However, I do think it has worked quite well. I think we're in the point where the government is depriving people of property all because they're saying words on the Internet. We're very close to the point where Great Britain is where they'll just straight up arrest you for saying mean things to certain people on Twitter. And I do I, think they might I, already be doing this. I do think there is the possibility of that happening. However, I still think it's very difficult to happen still in the U.S. I still think we're a bit ways away from Britain personally. Also, I remember not too long ago, the government proposed and actually passed into legislation making it a criminal act to criticize the government. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, Are we talking about the U.S. government or some... Uh, the other? U.S. government. I don't recall that. I'd have to see it. Yeah, it was proposed in, I forget the year, but it was, uh, I know it was nine years after the Constitution was ratified. It was called the Alien and Sedition Acts. Ah, uh, yes, that one was proposed, but I recall that it was never, uh, never it, it passed. Was pa it was passed into law. It was eventually overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court, but that should demonstrate very clearly that the kinds of limitations that you would hope to be put in, you would hope to put into place aren't exactly going to be terribly effective in making sure that the government doesn't become tyrannical. Why to say nothing of the fact that the founding fathers were not only still alive, but still in power. 
Well, I would have to bit disagree with a bit on that because I think it actually shows that it worked, although it took a little bit of time. Sorry, I'm back. That the Supreme Court was willing to tear, take that law apart. The fact that they were willing to is definitely a good thing. We can't dispute that. But the fact that that was even passed in the law in the first place indicates that, well, there was a tremendous failure from the very beginning. Hell, how the, how the hell do they even have power in the first place to throw people in the cage? Because they say words that certain politicians don't like. Okay, uh, SO and Dark Khan, if you want a quick respond to the question on the screen. Uh, I... gonna... Oh, never mind. By the way, I did not know you could bring up questions like this. How do you limit a country throughout the long term? Well, I think it's pretty clear that no, you can't. Uh, there are various sort of systemic reasons which will ensure that states can't be limited. As my opponents conceded to earlier in the debate, and yeah, I, I'd say that the U.S. is probably the most clear example of this, but that also would assume that that was sort of the intention. I, I'd really recommend everybody to read some of the things written uh, by George Washington, Ben Franklin, Hamilton, Adams, some, and the other people who've signed the Declaration of Independence. Um, read into some of the things they've said about finance and some of the their connections to the Bank of England because what I, I mean, I've done a bit of research into that and it seems like from the beginning of the American Revolution was uh, bankrolled by the Bank of England and the people who signed the Declaration of Independence were agents of the Rothschild banking dynasty. But even before that, uh, something that was brought up earlier in this debate is the continuity between liberalism and libertarianism and that's simply not true. Uh, even in the conception of liberalism, it was never the aim of liberalism and the premises which make up liberalism were never synonymous or even comparable to libertarianism. Okay, I'm going to have to cut you off there. Uh, Dark Khan, if you have anything to respond, we need to get to the rest of the questions. Um, as far as Rothschild and, the, um, uh, and whatever, uh, whoever might have funded the Founding Fathers... I would say that uh, on the surface of that, just on the surface of that, I don't really care unless somebody was to like actually point out the immoralities entailed by uh, that certain conspiracy. But anyway, um, how do you limit a government? I would say that for the most part, and uh, I think Nate mentioned the U.S. Uh, asking, is that an example? I would say yes, to an extent it was. Um I mean, obviously, there were like some invasion, uh, invasions of freedom and so forth, like particularly when it came to Abe Lincoln arresting people for, um, you, you, you know, for criticizing the Civil War. I, I would say like up until about um, probably around the time that the Federal Reserve was made, but definitely by the time of FDR, we were, relatively speaking, fairly limited in our governance despite whatever failings happened on down the road. And I would say subjectively, those uh, issues have to be resolved. All right, moving on to the next question coming from Choppa Cat. Uh, do you differentiate between government governance from a state? Um, mm. Do you differentiate government and governance from a state? Not, not necessarily. I mean, uh, governance or government, well, the word governance, that has other context to it other than a, uh, you know, an all-encompassing big daddy government ruling over a country like uh, people like the... Anyway, I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. There are other contexts of gov governance, but in this context, no, I would not differentiate government and governance from the state. I think there is a fairly subtle difference. The definition, the differentiation I use is that a state encompasses the entirety of the society plus the government, whereas the government is very much the financial firm that engages in the monopoly and arbitration. I, Darkon, would you find this definition or this differentiation reasonable? The government is the organization that runs the state, in other yes. words? Yes. I mean, I guess essentially so. That's fair. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it also depends on the context. Like if we're going to talk about a firm uh, governing its finances, if you're going to use the term in that context, then yeah, obviously that's different from a state uh, because it's not sort of a an organization that the state is. It's just a firm managing itself. I mean, that is a that's one way the term can be used. But in terms of how we're describing sort of the government or the state as sort of an external organization which uh, attempts to centrally control society, um, no, I would not say there's a difference between government and the state except for the sort of subtle difference that Filthy pointed out. Organizationally, it's the same. Rational Outlaw, did you have anything to add? Uh, I have no comment. All right, moving on to the next question, which comes from J.C. Armitage. If the only state in the world was a minarchist utopia, wouldn't that make it the biggest state in the world? Food for thought. Yes. <laughs> exactly. That's And that's exactly what I was pointing out. Well, big as in the amount of land that it has jurisdiction over. Yes, in that context, yes. Well, yeah, but when it. we're talking about uh, big government, we're talking uh, primarily about what power it has in uh, in relation to the population that the government has jurisdiction over. But that's but that's not the point he's getting at. He's not talking about the geographical size of its boundary compared to other governments. It's that there are no other governments to compare it to. So by so, default, it is the yeah. it is the government that represses people's freedom the most. Okay, yeah. how, okay. how can I, you make an ethical evaluation of a government if there are no other governments to compare it to? If I well, could okay. say, if, if, in a technical if, sense, yes, but in a realistic sense, since there, there would be unlikely for it to be there only one minarchist government and everywhere else is an anarchist society, uh, no. Well, considering that the UN exists. Well, uh, by extension of... Uh, if the minarchist state was to exist, be the only state in the world that exists, it would be the biggest state in the world. Well, then, yeah, obviously, if you have just a five foot uh, tall midget elephant and there are no 10 foot tall elephants at all, well, then, of course. And that's also the thing, like, you're saying that it would be impractical. Well, that's kind of irrelevant because if, if it were impractical for one government to exist, I agree with you. What that is impractical? The, the idea that there would only ever be one government in the world. I agree well, that, I that, I that, agree that okay. that's... Well, no, what Rational Outlaw said is that that would be impractical, so that's not really a scenario. No, I'm not saying it would be impractical. I'm saying it's unrealistic that there would only yeah, be, well, there'd be impractical multiple and governments that would form. The point that I was uh, getting at, though, is that since this is an ethical dilemma and we're talking about an axiom, it's kind of irrelevant how practical or how it doesn't re seem really an ethical question it just seems more like a would be for uh this to be the case the fact is is that there is an exception to the standard of evaluating governments by their scale a very clear one therefore the concept is invalid because that's the thing with ethical arguments as absolutes if there is one contradiction that means the whole thing falls apart not exactly the point I was making, but okay. Uh, can we go on to the next question? Sure. All right, moving on to the next question, which comes from the Servius. Hey, Servius. Why should our taxes pay for it to secure the... Pe I, I think what he means is why should our taxes pay to secure the people slash nation? Hmm. The best way to articulate that, I would have to come up with a better answer in the in the future. Why should our taxes pay for it to secure the people or nation? Hmm. Well, I would say that there is technically no should to that. What I say should not happen, though, is people murdering, raping, whatever else have you. Uh, completely stealing a person's house or business. That's what should not happen. And uh, 
if there is to like to be a conventional state that exists to that will tax people to like um um okay well, let me uh rewind myself a little bit i say that there should not be any of those types of uh, infringements on liberty be it rape st- um stealing property or murder or so forth and there should be no one getting away with it i say um and if there is to be like a uh, conventionally conceived state that taxes people to make courts and whatnot to preserve that kind of thing, to preserve rights, liberties, and due process, well, then I say it's not that big a deal. But like I said a little bit earlier in, in this debate, I would like to see some experimentation with taxation to make it uh, not uh, coercive, or at least not in the conventional state of coercive. Well, the way you make co- taxation not coercive is you make the government not a government. It, you make it a <laughs> private business. Um, here's this, this is kind of a thing that you said earlier as uh, well, uh, Filthy. You said that if, um, if I am for like some form of voluntary tax, quote unquote, to fund a court, then therefore I am not an... Uh, I am an anarchist and not a minarchist. The thing that I would say that kind of differentiates me from a, at least a typical anarchist, is that the private court would hold to accountable some, uh, would hold to accountable criminals and make sure that they don't get away with it and put forth a vet, an investigation to make sure whether or not a person is innocent or not of committing a certain crime, whatever it may be. Which I don't think is going to be controversial among anarchists either. All right, I'm going to keep this moving for the sake of time. we got more questions to get to. Uh, Nate's yeah, question, sorry. governments don't last as long as anarchies. Why set up a government in the first place? I'll let you I go, have to disagree I time. with that. I believe anarchies don't uh, last even shorter. We can find governments in which they've lasted thousands of years. For example, the Chinese government, although it has gone through many different rulers, it has been, it's the longest continuous civilization in current history. Well, you're, you're conflating civilization with the state, and you yourself just said it. The regime has changed and split up into different governments and then reformed again multiple different times throughout those last thousand years. In fact, not a single one of them's lasted for more than 100 to 200 years. The average age of a country is around 200 years of how long they last. I believe an anarchy is government would not nearly last that long at least well and well of course an anarch- anarchistic government wouldn't last very right, long I mean, because there wouldn't exist society. i meant an anarchist society if i may clarify yeah so well, the tongue and then, well let's see here uh Kaspaya lasted somewhere around 500 years you had ancient ireland which lasted thousands of how years how big were those though how big was the population not relevant to the point though i mean not i, to mention I, that I believe it is. is relevant to the point because it's the not size no. of the amount of people because the more people you have the more differing views you have the more different views you have the more fights you'll have it, to say nothing of the fact that governments are a fairly recent phenomenon in human history during only the last we 50- actually have had them for a lot longer than what you probably believe because we still have had also tribes those are actually, we, know, we know exactly how long governments have existed it's about 5500 years the first documented government was the empire of Samaria and, and what about though that about tribe? We, we had we had we've had well, intercontinental thing, trade for uh we yeah, had intercontinental uh, oceanic trade out. for but we've also had tribes in which those had their own rules and laws those are also some forms of government although be it's very small they're they not though, government. Uh, there's no evidence to support that they had monopolies and arbitration a government is not rules. A government is a monopoly on arbitration. You can have rules in the absence of a government. All right. Uh, I'm just going to point out Pumpkin Road. Uh, they inadvertently answered your question, uh, which was which state has lasted longer than uh, I, the Irish anarchy. So I, I think you can, you've heard what both sides have to say about that. Uh, I believe the first super chat was... Uh, what are your positions on the nuking of Japan in World War Two? Should we uh, answer? Should we answer that one? I don't even know if I, I need to answer I that. Just no. answer the anarchy one again, just really quickly. 
I don't believe Ireland was an anarchist society. I believe at the most it was a minarchist society because of the tribes they had. But there was competing arbitration, so it wasn't a state society. Not in perhaps the modern sense, but it is a form of government. It seemed to have like a whole bunch of miniature uh, states with the chieftains and tribes. You're just taking firms and then calling them states. That would be that would be like calling Walmart a state to call these uh, two off a states. Basically, a government is a monopoly on arbitration, and in the absence of that monopoly, it's well, it's not a government. I mean, doesn't the tribe have a uh, monopoly on arbitration with its few dozen uh, tribesmen and it's like one acre of land or whatever s small no, amount? No, because it doesn't, it doesn't use coercion to suppress other arbiters or force people to associate with it. I would the fact say that matter it is that it's people, own people to associate with itself. It keeps their tribe members from leaving. Well, they were free they to leave. Them with forcing them to leave, except for in those cases, it would, I believe it punishes its people when they leave or betray the tribe. People were free to leave at any time and associate with any Tuatha that they wished. Not to mention that they were free to get uh, Brennans, who were the judges at the time, to adjudicate any disputes that they had in the tribe or between tribes, even if the uh, Brennan in question had no association with either party. In fact, oftentimes this was more often than not the case because uh, people people were more interested in having an uninterested third party to dispute the case, so they are certain that the dispute was resolved fairly. The absence of a monopoly very clearly demonstrates that there was no government involved. And let's and clarify, because I, I just saw somebody say, uh, tribal societies did have wars. Well, we're not talking about tribal societies. We're talking about a specific society which had firms um and that was ireland and no there was no coercive monopoly on force there and should we uh go into the question of nuking japan what is your opinion position on nuking japan i believe it was a necessary evil i mean as uh far as uh, i'm concerned for right now anyways i think it was uh, necessary for the context and time of things uh and obviously if there were alternatives it would have been a, a whole lot more preferable, but anyways. Well, there were there were alternatives actually. In fact, the matter is, Japan was suing for peace around April or May, if I recall correctly. They were going through Switzerland, who were of course neutral in the war as an intermediary in an attempt to get in contact with the U.S. And Japan's terms of surrender were actually incredibly reasonable. They were willing to surrender completely unconditionally, except that they wanted to keep their emperor. And the United States thought that this was unacceptable, and so they were trying to push for an unconditional surrender. This was ended it? up result. This ended up resulting in uh, the war continuing surrender? for a lot longer than was strictly necessary, and eventually culminated in the nuking of Japan. Of the of Hiroshima was the first one, if I, if I recall correctly. Could you now, please send us the link for this so I could look at it later? And yeah, sure. Also, was okay, you're, you guys are going to have to, as far as the sources, we'll have to work that off offline. I'm going to allow this one final question, and then we're going to go into closing statements uh, okay. uh, for everyone else. I'm sorry we didn't get your questions, but we only have a limited amount of time. So Night Shift 10,000 asks, uh, uh, to the positive side, if you don't want universal health care for everyone, why are you in support of universal security that has the ability to strip people of their rights? Are we talking about cops and police forces or are we talk i about presume that it, i presume that public police law enforcement agencies would be who he's talking about but night shift if you wish to clarify put another comment up well like i said kind of earlier i uh, am not for complete nationalization of every single industry and this would kind of include uh security as well i guess i would have to like further clarify on what uh i think would kind of be ideal with uh, security like there are a whole bunch of private security groups that say let's say uh, mayors and city council of multiple different cities can hire out and contract those certain private uh private police forces uh for as far as um enforcement uh, of the law and making sure that nobody murders and that other kind of stuff and uh if uh, they find them to be faulty well then they contract out to say another uh private security force um 
Uh, just kind of like in the same way that uh, cities uh, contract out construction companies. Um, I guess uh, that would be where I start off with in regards of that. Well, I guess my reasoning against uh, a universal healthcare system is because one, it'd be the worst thing that's probably one of the things that the government is the worst at. And two, is that it's a continually growing cost. The costs are continually growing within a universal healthcare system. So it doesn't matter. It, the only way you could sustain it is by having a continually growing workforce. But I, either way, I still don't think it's worth it because of the immense costs and the immense inefficiency compared to even other forms of state control of other forms of uh, things like the police force or military. It's perhaps the most the most inefficient form of government or sector of government, I should say. I mean, you could say literally the exact same thing about any other state service, but okay. All right, at this point, we're approaching the two hour mark. So I'm gonna give each side uh, the opportunity for a closing statement. I'm not gonna run the clock, but I ask that you try to keep it concise. Uh, I will cut you off if I think it's starting to run longer. So uh, Filthy Heretic, Esoteric, please mute your mics. And Darkon, Rational Outlaw, you have, uh, I'd say two to four minutes, make your closing statement uh, regarding the debate. Yeah, um, I guess to kind of uh, clarify, um, in regards to the whole definition thing, my whole point is that I don't I don't find anarchism or libertarianism to be completely synonymous with each other. As uh, not mean to straw man, it almost seems uh, logically what Esso is was kind of implying with the whole uh, definition thing. Logically implying with the whole definition argument here. Um, and uh, man, there was something else I wanted to address uh, about that, but I can't remember. And as far as tax taxation goes, like I said, I find it morally ideal if there was not to be some uh, coercive tax system. But on the other hand, I don't find it to be um, overall immoral, or at least objectively speaking anyways. Um, and I would point out the U.S. as being a, a kind of a, an example. Well, actually, I guess I already pointed it out of being an example of minarchism back in its early days anyways at least um and uh, the conception of scale i kind of wish that we gone like addressing this part during this whole discussion a little bit more but i would say that as far as um measuring how authoritarian or libertarian a society is and uh, how hands off that the the state or the government is with that country it is not ar arbitrary I mean, uh, pr um, leaving people to their religious liberties, their drug liberties, their sex liberties, their gun liberties, their private property liberties, all that kind of stuff. That's not arbitrary, I would say. And if really measuring up and comparing countries' uh, liberty to each other is arbitrary, well, then that would mean that the uh, economic freedom scale is absolutely arbitrary in of itself. But we still kind of uh, use that. And uh, I think it's fair to use the economic freedom index. Um, okay, Rational Outlaw, you have anything to say? Yeah, uh, I would like to say I still believe that minarchism is the best way that we have in preventing, um, not preventing, sorry, uh, keeping as much liberty as possible for as long as time as possible. I do not believe the... Uh, uh, what was it, the Ireland or Irish? I forget, uh, what was it? Uh, ancient Ireland. Yes, uh, ancient Ireland. I don't think those were necessarily anarchist societies. As I said, those were tribal societies, a kind of form of government. It would be a more, more simplistic form of government. I do believe those were a form of government. And at the most, those were basically minarchist forms of government. Just they were very small societies. My whole point is that I believe minarchism in it of it today is the best we, way we have of keeping the most liberties for as long as possible. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Dark Con, Rational Outlaw, please mute your mics. Uh, Filthy Esso, you may unmute your mics and you have several minutes to make your closing statement. Okay, so, well, 
I only really had two things to say. It was one thing before uh, Dark Con uh, mentioned the scale argument. Well, sure, economically, there's a difference uh, between the expanse certain governments operate around, but that doesn't explain why they expand, and it also doesn't create an ethical argument. But I, and I'm thoroughly disappointed, I think, in this debate overall because i was expecting uh to go more into sort of the arguments for minarchy but uh it was like within 20 to 30 minutes into the debate i mean they had already conceded that their point what well, their arguments for minarchy just aren't actually tangible or, and there's nothing really to base them on so most of the time we were just making flawed arguments against anarchy but uh, something that I was going to say is if the only thing that can really be said at this point is that um, they think we're thinking, we're debating whether or not a minarchy is more sustainable or um, in the long term is more tangible than an anarchy. Well, the thing is, at this point, because of things like cryptocurrency, or serverless connections and because production and trade seems to be trending ever more towards uh, entrepreneurship and peer-to-peer -peer associations um, with things like micro cnc machines or 3d printers it seems like not only is that not the case but it seems pretty soon that uh by pretty soon, I mean the next time that we have another global depression. Um, statism will not be sustainable because the means by which a state sustains itself, the ability to consistently collect revenue through tax coercive taxation, uh, will not be reliable. So it seems not only is that not true, but it seems the opposite is true. At this point, anarchy is an inevitability. And at this point, I think a more helpful discussion going forward, at least personally, would be how do we ensure the most peaceful transition between a state society and an anarchy? And how, how exactly do we go about setting up sort of ensuring that there isn't that much chaos? So the point I just want to make is that the state is evil. There is no if, ands, or buts about it. The state is an unequivocal, unrepentant, injure, injure or to liberty, and ultimately humanity will be significantly better off for it. The idea that you can tweak to pick and choose what results from a government seizing power is not only incredibly conceited, but also not not clear or even accurate to what we can observe in reality. This is ultimately the problem with the minarchist argument that it's ultimately just a set of preferences for what you want a coercive monopoly to point people to point a gun at people to ultimately accomplish. In this sense, in this sense, and appealing to definitions used by philosophers both old and new, as to the definition of libertarianism, it is blatantly obvious that any libertarian society or libertarian cannot possibly be cannot possibly have a state and be consistent in the principles of libertarianism the only argument the only argument i have heard that contests this is either an appeal to authority to the definition of or to the dictionary definition, or alternatively, a pragmatic argument that really has nothing to do with principles or definitions. So with this in mind, yeah, the, the liber libertarianism in a libertarian society cannot have a state. The only way going forward is anarchy. Thank All you right. for doing that. Oh, oh, sorry, but... Can I just say, yeah, I, I was going to address that in my introduction, but I got cut off because I ran out of time. But yeah, th there cannot be a cohesive principled argument for political rule specifically because there's nothing which necessarily defines political rule other than just the use of force, which is arbitrary.
But yes, thank you for explaining that, Filthy. All right. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who watched. Uh, thank you to Darkon, Rational Outlaw, Filthy, and Esso for being willing to have this debate and do so in a uh, civil manner. It's certainly better than a lot of debates I've seen on YouTube. Uh, it was fun for me to get to host it and do the moderation, so thank you for asking me to be your moderator. Uh, and f for all those interested, I know I've, uh, all of us have videos on our channels that uh, discuss these topics in detail, and I'm sure uh, we're more than willing to take questions on Discord, comment section, or anywhere else. So everybody have a good night, and as always, that is my two cents. Take it for what it's worth. Bye. And have a Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and a Happy New Year. Yeah. I'm screenshotting that. I'm so screenshotting that. <laughs>